Good evening. Welcome back to school. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Nockber. I'm Public Relations Director in the Communications Office here at the UVM College of Medicine. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker for the first lecture in the fall 2014 series of Community Medical School, Dr. David Halsey. Dr. Halsey is an undergraduate alumnus of Middlebury College, and he received his medical degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey and completed an orthopedic surgery residency at UVM and the former Medical Center Hospital of Vermont. He had a private orthopedic surgery practice in Springfield, Vermont from 1993 to 2008 and served as Chief Medical Officer of Springfield Hospital from 2002 to 2007 before joining UVM Fletcher Allen as a full-time faculty member in 2008. He's been named Teacher of the Year in the Orthopedics Residency Program at Fletcher Allen in 2009 and 2014, and has received a number of awards, including the Presidential Award from the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, and has been named a Fellow in both the American Orthopedic Association and American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Dr. Halsey has also held and holds leadership positions in national societies, including currently serving as the vice chair of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Board of Specialty Societies, and serving on the board of the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. In Vermont, he currently serves on the One Care Vermont Clinical Advisory Board and the Green Mountain Care Board Technical Advisory Panel. It's my pleasure to have Dr. Halsey come speak to you tonight about too hip to hop. Well, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay in the back? Someone in the back, raise their hand if you can hear me. That's good. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm, I imagine most of you are just here to get out of the heat, and it's a lot cooler down here than up there, so if you'd like to move forward, please feel free to do so. It is my pleasure to address the community medical school for the second time. I see some familiar faces uh, from around town in the community, some, a few of you from uh, the office setting and here at the med school, so welcome. I hope this evening uh, meets your needs. My goal is, as we outlined in the little blurb we put online, was basically to have three goals. And in to accomplish those, we've got about an hour and a half. But I'm going to try to set aside at least a half an hour of that 90 minutes for us together as a community to have a conversation around the challenges of knee and hip arthritis. It's something that I uh, live and breathe every day in the office and in the evening with some of my work nationally. And uh, it's an area that I feel very privileged to be able to serve the patients in our community here and help them struggle uh, and get through the problems of hip and knee arthritis. Some of you may know I, I have a hip replacement, and so I've been challenged with a lot of the same questions you and your family members may be uh, having to meet when it comes to decisions about the medical and or surgical care for a disabling joint with arthritis. So uh, with that brief introduction, I'm gonna, we'll get started here and sort of try to do something fun to get started. Some of you may have seen this already, but given the fact that uh, summer is over and hockey's right around the corner, I thought I'd start off with this, uh, this piece for the people. We formed the Cherry Hatricks because we love hockey, we love to skate, and we want to play. We're all over 60, so what? We travel around the country, we'll play any club, any time, as long as they're on Social Security. You know, people say to me, you've had two hips replaced, why don't you slow down? I had the hips replaced so I could speed up. It's the best thing I ever did. Five years ago, the osteoarthritis got real bad. Never thought I'd get back on the ice, but now look. No pain, moving like a ninja. My advice, don't throw the whole car away just because you need new tires. For more information on getting your bones and joints back in the game, call the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons at one... So, a little... A little shameless promotional piece for our national organization. I've had the pleasure of serving that group for about 20 years and volunteering the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And its website called OrthoInfo, and that information is available to you in the material you got, is the second highest rated website in the world for medical information around musculoskeletal. Number one, a blue chip Mayo, Mayo Clinic Health, Mayo Health, tremendous. But the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons site called OrthoInfo just a terrific resource to reinforce the kinds of things we'll be talking about tonight. 
So here's a quick roadmap for our journey together. And again, if you are looking to stay cool, come on down front as you come on in, because there are some seats down here and it's a little cooler. We're going to talk about what is osteoarthritis. In the survey of community med school members in years past, information was desired specifically on what's going on with the disease, some of the pathophysiology, that's the doctor word for what's actually going wrong with me, and we'll cover that as it relates in some detail to osteoarthritis, the most common type of arthritis that afflicts the hip and knee. And then we'll d deep dive into the spectrum of medical treatment. So when I talk about medical, I mean everything but surgical. Okay, so we're going to cover that, those topics, and we'll have lots of opportunity in the Q&A, and I've got some other videos we can look at that may help us in that regard as well. And then finally, we'll cover in depth the surgical treatment options. We'll learn a lot why each of these work together, not just medical, not just surgical, but oftentimes patients who suffer from osteoarthritis need both types of ongoing treatment care plans to help them be successful and keep active in the community with their family, keep their social circle wide, as we hope to do here in Vermont. And that comes sometimes from a combination of medical and surgical treatment. So is that why you guys came here? Are those are the topics? Have we covered it? OK, you're in the right place. So what is osteoarthritis? I went to Deerfield and then Middlebury and loved my classics. And so I love to break things down into the roots. So osteo means bone, arthro means joint, Itis means damage or inflammation. So when you see those three words, you really have got the lecture. We could move on to the next topic here. Osteo, bone, arthro, joint, itis, damage or inflammation. So when we're speaking about osteoarthritis, we're talking about an, an ailment of the joint that has inflammation or damage, but not just the joint, the surrounding bone. And that's somewhat unique to this particular type of arthritis. Significant changes go on in the bone and joint and therefore, the treatments have to be designed to address both of those problems. So here's your typical joint. Those of you who were here in 2010 when I did our first the 101 level class in this will see that, remember this slide, synovial joints. That means joints that move. There are some joints in our body that don't move very much, but the ones that move are all lined with synovial tissue that gives the nutrition to support the components of the joint. So every joint has a bone and a bone. So this is just in our typical joint. So there's the bone facing the bone, and on the ends of the bone are this magic material. It's like ice gliding on ice. Articular cartilage. Never been able to be replicated in a laboratory. Pick a laboratory around the world. No one's ever been able to make something artificial or natural, even close to what our human bodies do, making these two slippery surfaces on the end of any two bones that rub together, articular cartilage. Around the joint is a fibrous gristle membrane. We call that the capsule or the fibrous capsule. You know that tissue is the thing you've got to tear to break open the drumstick off the chicken leg to be able to see the shiny white cartilage underneath. That shiny white cap on the chicken leg is the articular cartilage for that joint. And the gristle you have to rip apart in order to be able to see it is the capsule. And finally, you have fluid within this space. There is a small space between the bone end and the bone end capped with cartilage surrounded by gristle. And there's fluid in the joint produced by the synovial membrane. That's the nutritional sleeve inside the capsule that brings the nutrition and health building blocks, takes away the debris from the moving joint. So that's what we're talking about. This is a big part of orthopedics are the joints. And that's a typical, typical joint. Osteoarthritis, there's a problem with the joint cartilage, the membrane, the capsule, the bone, and the fluid. So when we have trouble with our osteoarthritic joints, every single part of a healthy joint is deranged or ill. And we have to focus our care on that. So here's just some orientation pictures. So hip and knee. So knee here, thigh bone known as the femur, shin bone, the tibia. They come together, capped with shiny white cartilage. There's the joint. This is the kneecap sitting in the front as the shield to the front of the, of the uh, thigh bone. There's supporting gristle structures called ligaments on the outside and inside the typical knee joint. On the hip, this is the wing of your pelvis. So if I was to put my hands on my hip here, right here on my side like this, I'm actually putting my hands up on the rim of the pelvis. And we all say, there's my hip. But in fact, the hip is in the groin. If everyone can see where I'm pointing, this is where my hip is. So everyone says, you know, we talk about being here as I'm showing pain up in my hip, but the actual hip joint is in the groin. And that's an important distinction. But here we are again, bone to a bone, this is the ball and socket joint of the hip, capped with shiny white articular cartilage, surrounded by the gristle called the capsule. 
and kept together by the supporting muscle structures for the bone. And so every joint looks just like that. These are the two we're going to focus on tonight, OK? So what is articular cartilage and what, what does it do? Well, articular cartilage is that shiny white cap on the bone ends that protects the bone ends and shares the loads and allows the joints to slide and glide with virtually no friction, like ice on ice. It's really remarkable tissue. And here's a, a diagram of what it would, articular cartilage would look like. Here's the bone at the bottom. Then you have this cap. It has collagen fibers. That's the stuff we are made of, collagen. And in between the collagen fibers, cells that provide the nutrients and reparative structures early on in cartilage to try to heal cartilage. Those are the very same cells that lose their function in programming later on in life to begin the problem of aging of cartilage and osteoarthritis. There's also sugars and protein compounds that make up this goo inside the cartilage that we call the matrix. So now you have a picture of at least what it looks like. The bone, the cartilage cap with both cells, a matrix of a material that holds water like a sponge, a top surface, and then the outside of actually the joint. So that's what it would look like. So what is it made of? Cartilage is made of mainly collagen, water, the sugars, and the cells called chondrocytes. Inside the matrix, the goo inside the cartilage, we have these familiar names. These are where, in the last 20 years, orthopedic science has tried to, to uh, prevent or to restore cartilage problems in osteoarthritis by eating glucosamine or chondroitin or having hyaluronic acid injections in your knee. So we've been trying for decades to stop this process of cartilage deterioration known as osteoarthritis, yet we have not found the solution yet. We now know that taking these supplements or doing those injections may help with the symptoms a little bit temporarily, but are not the key to the solution of osteoarthritis. So as I said at the outset, damage to any of the structures, the bone, the cartilage, the ligaments, the gristle, the fluid, the lining, tissue joint, any of those things can start a downward spiral of destruction of the joint, known as osteoarthritis. Okay? Biomechanics. Got to have a little biomechanics when it comes to orthopedics in the community med school. Biomechanics means how does the body move and remain stable? Simplistically, think of your articular cartilage, that cap on the end of every moving bone in your body, as a sponge, a very specialized sponge that holds water and therefore provides shock absorption and load sharing for life. Well, imagine now on a night like tonight, you leave the sponge out on the counter and it's pretty hot out and the sponge dries out, it doesn't have the same cushion or shock absorption. It no longer has that ability to share the load of life from walking. So that little bit of, a little bit of a poor man's analogy where the sponge, when it's nice and new and moist, it's shock absorbing and the water flows in and out very easily with activity. Think of the dried up older sponge. Some of that is what's going on. Not a bad idea to think about what's going on in osteoarthritis. So you, what happens in this very highly organized structure where the proteins and the sugars and the collagen normally hold water in as a sponge, water flows in, water flows out through life and walking, the loss of that balance of water in, water out, and load sharing is a nice simple way of thinking about what normal cartilage does. It's a shock absorber. So as you lose that ability to shock absorb, more of the loads of life are transferred to the other supporting tissues, the bone underneath, the ligaments, the meniscus, the labrum cartilages of the joints. They take more load. They begin to fail over time. So you begin to see the cycle of, of what's going on in a joint. So in the first two decades of life, this is the story none of us like to hear, when we're really young, cartilage actually has the ability, to a degree, to heal itself. But it loses that ability. That balance of repair and degradation goes the wrong way with time. Not in everybody. Not everybody gets osteoarthritis. But all patients do have a change in the balance between the making of and the breaking down of normal cartilage and those supportive fluids and proteins and sugars and collagen in the cartilage. And as it loses its shock absorption, damage to the bone and neighboring structures can occur. So there's a cycle here. Many of you may have a little bit of this cycle. I know I do. A good weekend activities, uh, working in the garden, out for a good long bike ride, playing a little tennis. Joint gets swollen. It doesn't want to move it. It's a little stiff. The muscles get tight. I lose motion. It hurts a little bit more. And you have sort of this cycle of trouble with your joints. Familiar to anybody in the room? Heard anything like that? OK, 
Good, no idea what I'm talking about, right? What is the inciting event? Well, sometimes it's an injury. So I'm sure there's some folks in the room. I had an injury at Middlebury. An injury to the joint starts a problem. So a lot of times there's a small or large traumatic event in the early years that your body can't really manage completely and you have deterioration of the joint over time. Very common in the back, by the way. Okay, but not always because sometimes it just happens without damage. This is our lifestyle. This is what we want to do. But there's lots of patients who have osteoarthritis who cannot remember a particular injury. They did not have a clear damage to a joint. So not always. So there's more going on than just damage. But here's how we'd like to try to be. But we are pretty tough on our joints in these days. So what does it look like now? I've been talking about a damage or problems with the articular cartilage. Here's that healthy knee picture again. This is going to be a knee pain, osteoarthritis kind of scenario. And the osteoarthritic knee, the sponge has lost its shock absorption. The cartilage starts to lose some of its thickness. It cracks, it crumbles, it breaks off a little like, sorry, blue cheese a little bit. And you end up with bare spots. And then more bare spots. And then more wear, more load, more bone spurs forming, distending the capsule or the gristle. The joint gets bigger. Take a look at the knuckle. Somebody in the room, I'm sure your knuckle's bigger or your knee looks bigger. Those are the spurs and the thickening of the tissue around. Same thing happens in the hip. So the normal healthy picture of the hip we saw before, cartilage gets rough, bone spurs form, joint space gets narrowed, capsule gets thick, the problem of the stiff hip syndrome, which some of you may suffer from, the arthritic hip. So are we just getting older? Because I said it doesn't always take trauma to do this, and it doesn't. But it, not everybody who gets old gets arthritis either. And getting old and arthritis are different, and here they are. Everybody's joints age, obviously, with time. But the changes that go on in the osteo, I'll use that OA, osteoarthritic joint, or just the aging joint are not the same. So we all age. We all have some fibrillation in areas of the joint. Interestingly, not the same areas break down most of the time that we, where you see it in a joint that has osteoarthritis. There's not a lot of changes in the chemical nature of the cartilage to a degree, not a big shift in the water content, and not much in the way of bony changes in the just aging joint. In the osteoarthritic joint, we see changes in the water, but having more water content at first, and then loss of control of that water balance, and some leakage of the cartilage, and loss of its shock absorption role, and bony changes. So aging and osteoarthritis are not the same thing. So what's going wrong? The pathogenesis in med school here, OK? Well, we don't know. Wait a minute now. That's not possible. It's 2014, 15. We must know. By the way, osteoarthritis is the most common medical condition for which people on this planet seek medical care. It's not heart disease. Now, viral syndrome, upper respiratory tract infection, that's probably the most common, but most of those people never see a doctor for. But for people who like, get into the complicated morass of the healthcare world, osteoarthritis is really pretty much the most likely reason. Is it your back? Is it the neck? Is it a hip? Is it a knee? Is it a hand? Is it, it's, osteoarthritis is a major source of loss of joy of life, loss of productivity in the workplace, especially with spinal disorders. They're also related to the same condition of cartilage deterioration, loss of motion, and back problems. So how is it possible we don't know? Well, lots of good work to be done. Maybe this medical school class won't solve it, but maybe the folks that are usually in here every day will be able to do that for us. But there's a lot of work been done. And actually, some of that good work has been done right here at the University of Vermont as it relates to knees. But since we really, we really don't know, there's been a tremendous amount of research over the control mechanisms and the messaging and what's going on to change this balance of making the enzymes, that enzymes that build up good cartilage versus the ones that break down cartilage. And that mismatch or that change in the balance is part of the problem with osteoarthritis. But we don't actually know precisely what's going on. And that's why we don't actually have a cure for this problem, the most common medical condition, basically, that infirms the human existence. So, if you add even small amounts of trauma to this not terribly un well understood problem, you get even acceleration of osteoarthritis. So avoid re-injury to the osteoarthritic hip or knee is important. And that's largely the role of some of the medical management we'll talk about. Because we don't have a pill to solve the problem. You can't take insulin like for diabetes. You don't, we don't have a 
cardiac medication for blood pressure control or an arrhythmia. We don't have that for osteoarthritis. All we have is symptom suppression. That's how we treat osteoarthritis. Control the symptoms, not the underlying disease process. We have a long way to go to really master this condition. So the supporting structures matter a lot. I talked about we don't really know what's going on with the cartilage to the degree we need to, but we do know that other tissues are also involved at the time of the deterioration. So bones get bruised, microfracture, the cartilage of the hip known as the labrum or the knee, the meniscus, have a role they can get injured, they can be injured and help accelerate osteoarthritis. They can, you can be injured after you already have arthritis of the knee. So many structures are involved. The lining tissue of the joint, the supporting ligaments are important. And even the nerves that control the muscles around the joint are important for stabilizing and keeping ongoing injury to a minimum. So in summary, here's the take slide for the first third of the talk. We're 20 minutes in. What is the real cause of osteoarthritis? We don't know. But we have this insight that there's a loss of balance between the reparative and breakdown processes that go on in articular cartilage that in this time and place is a downward trend. We cannot change that downward trend through medical treatment, unfortunately. So the cartilage loses some of its important components. It loses its effect, if you will, of a sponge. You can take home that sponge analogy, and it, provide, it, it results in increase on the entire rest of the joint. All the other parts of the joint are involved with osteoarthritis, okay? Quick question about osteoarthritis that's burning that we need to address right now before we go on to the next segment. We'll have plenty of time at the end. Looks like we're okay. All right, we'll move on. How about who gets this problem? I talked about the scale of the burden of disease for osteoarthritis. The planet suffers from osteoarthritis in many ways, but who's really affected? Let's just use the knee as an example here. Who is affected? Well, our current data, this is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. 29 million Americans, 25 or older in age, already have osteoarthritis, significant percentage of our population. Here's the scary one, right? Go out to 2030, which, by the way, isn't very long from now. It, it goes up almost threefold, two and a half times. So we have a big problem. We have the most common condition. It's becoming more prevalent as our population ages, and we still don't have a medical treatment for the problem. So when you come to the doctor's office, how, does, how, do, how do we approach this? If I'm in the office of my physician's assistant or nurse practitioner, part of the team for the UVM medical group, uh, joint replacement group, we, we'll start off with listening. And that's a really big part of orthopedic health care, whether it's osteoarthritis or not because you're going to tell us what's wrong with you most of the time. If we take the time to listen and sit down with you and spend some time and you tell your story, that's really important, by the way. It's easier for women than men. So for the men in the audience, if you come into the physician looking for help, be prepared to have a bit of a talk about it if you can, okay? It, it really helps us. It really helps us. So we need a detailed history of what's going on. It might be a very dramatic thing, and you tell me your tale of the of the garage sale, ski accident, accident crash, when the gloves and poles and skis went everywhere, and that doc, I know, that's when my knee started to have my trouble. Or it might be, I used to be able to walk the golf course, now I can't because I have this groin pain, it seems to have come on gradually. There's all kinds of presentations for how osteoarthritis starts. But if we listen and we take the time to listen, you will probably tell us, and we can refine the thoughts. I have knee pain, I have groin pain. There could be a lot of things that aren't osteoarthritis going on there. But if we listen, we'll get down to a much smaller list of potential problems, most of which are musculoskeletal. Some might not be. It's important. Then we'll do the physical examination, almost always use x-ray, and then we'll put the pieces of the puzzle together and have a conversation about what we discovered as we analyze your sore hip or sore knee that day. That should take about 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour. This shouldn't be a 12-minute office visit. If it's a 12-minute office visit, I didn't do my job because I can't listen, examine, look at x-rays, come up with a plan, and make recommendations. And so it should take some time. So plan that it takes some time and demand from your physician that it takes some time. So you come prepared to the office with your questions so we can have a good, meaningful start to our relationship together. And then there's this one, which when you go to the primary care doctor's office, it's always a blood test is next. What do you guys think is the best blood test for osteoarthritis? Anybody have an idea? Yell out like in school. No. C-reactive protein is a marker for inflammation. It could be helpful in, in certain things. 
but it doesn't actually help us at all with osteoarthritis. Important for the heart, important looking for infection, variety of things, right? No help for osteoarthritis. <laughs> okay, what, the other tests, what about all those other tests, right? There must be, what's that? Calcium levels help us with another one. This has got to love orthopedics. Osteoporosis, right? That's the thinning of the bone, not this ailment. So not too helpful here. Important for that one, though. Absolutely. Short answer, no blood test, right? For a rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or Lyme disease or enteropathic, there's zillions of kinds of arthritis, by the way, probably 57 to 60 current named different kinds of arthritis. No blood test for this one. Back to history. Good physical exam and x-ray. We don't have any blood tests for this problem. If we had a blood test, we'd actually probably know what's really wrong, and then we could actually probably come up with a pharmaceutical or something treatment, hopefully natural treatment for it, but we don't have that. Okay, so now we move on to quick x-ray appearance. The normal knee, I'll just use the healthy knee here, thigh bone, shin bone, a space. that You all med students now all know there's no space, right? It's filled with shiny white articular cartilage that has no calcium in it, so it doesn't show up on x-ray. So it's a space. And here is the bad knee. Bone, bone, no space. So you can imagine that that articular cartilage has completely been eroded away, exposing the subchondral bone. Bone takes all the pressure. That hurts. Osteoarthritis. In fact, it's gapped open on the outside here because he's so bow-legged now because he's worn out the brake pad on the inside and he's gapping the outside of the joint that puts all the ligaments and stuff on stretch. That hurts. So don't be surprised when you're bow-legged but my pain dog's on the outside of my knee because the soft tissues are under tension. Same thing for the hip. Here's a hip x-ray, pelvis, the ball and socket, the upper end of the thigh bone, the bump on the side of your hip. So I put my hip way down over, look, watch my hand over here on the side, not up on the pelvic rim, but here. So this must be my hip, right? No, nope. that's this bump here where the muscles attach to the hip again. Remember that the hip is in your groin. If you reach right where you think your groin would be, sort of midway between the midline and the side, that's where the hip joint is. And in the arthritic one, we say, well, where's the space there? I don't even see it. So the space is eroded, bone spurs have formed. The limb is actually a little shorter than the other side osteoarthritis of the hip. Got it? That's, that's what we're looking at. MRI scans, CAT scans, bone scans, ultrasound, don't need them to make the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. Only time I need the fancier stuff to help you or we need it is when you've got this x-ray, but when I listen to you on the top of my list was, boy, I think this is osteoarthritis. That's what it's going to be. The x-ray is going to look really bad. Bang, we get this x-ray, normal. Mismatch. That's when we add the technology, expensive technology. $2,500 for an MRI scan top line, okay? I mean, it's a lot of money, okay? So, so we're, we don't, we, you know, and, and I'm afraid in North America now, almost everybody thinks, well, doctors have lost the ability to listen and examine, so we must go to the MRI every time. Well, there's a lot of that pressure going on, so a lot of times, actually, we're kind of talking, talking you out of the MRI if we can carefully establish the diagnosis without it. Sometimes we absolutely need it, okay? So, now we've, uh, we've learned about the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis, what we know about it, and we've learned a little bit about how we should approach our visit together with uh, a good, meaningful conversation around your symptoms. Examination of the body, checking the hip or knee range of motion, the strength, the alignment, the feel, the motor, the function, the sensory, blood pressure, everything. We do all that. X-ray, help us look for it the classic changes of osteoarthritis, loss of joint space, bone spurs, dense bones, stick change. Here we are. We now have, we're in the, the tail end of the office visit. We've done the workup. Now we're having the conversation. You're having the conversation with me or anyone about osteoarthritis. What are the treatment options? Fine, doc. We spent all this time. You've figured out what it is. What am I going to do about it? That's why I came to you. But we're going to talk about the spectrum of treatment options now, OK? So the treatment of osteoarthritis. There's the list. Let's take a minute and take a look at that. It's not like 12, 15, 30 different things or ways. It's a pretty short list. And in fact, you would say, I don't even need to come to the doctor probably for some of these things anyway. But so here's what I'm going to focus on. Health and behavioral modifications. We'll talk about that a little bit. What does that mean? That means living with your problem. Remember, we have not got a medical cure for this problem. So we want to help you limit your pain, limit your risk of fall, very real, very meaningful, 
don't want falls, and limit future damage to the joint. So we'll talk about that. We use rehabilitative exercise, either self-directed, instructed by the physician or by a physical therapist, to avoid stiffness and muscle weakness. Because guess what? If you're stiff and weak, you're more likely to damage your knee again and have a fall and all of that. That's what that's all about. But none of this is really doing very much with your pain, which is why you came to me. So now we're on to symptom suppression. So that is medication, essentially. It's not very exciting. Most people say, I don't want to take pain medicine for my joint pain. I want my joint pain gone. That's all I want, and I don't want to take medicine for it, OK? OK, we'll talk about that. But there are medications and some supplement conversations that we have with our patients, we should. And then there's injections of medication in the joint. We'll talk about that a little bit. So those first four are the full 401 level class, senior medical student, top line, best there is medical treatment for osteoarthritis. That sounds like aspirin to me. <laughs> well, guess what? The single most cost effective and clinically effective treatment for osteoarthritis is your mother's aspirin. It can't possibly be the case, but it is. All the expensive ones, the Mobic, the Celebrex, the Naproxen, the $3 a pill, the really fancy ones, the ones that were taken off the market because they were so dangerous, actually, none of them were ever shown to be any better than aspirin. So at the start, when you have this visit with the surgeon and you're coming away with aspirin, that's kind of a bummer, but that's the state of the art of the medical treatment of osteoarthritis for pain. It's not narcotics. It's not narcotics. It's not a uh, lifelong prednisone or steroids type of thing. The class of medicines that are like aspirin, if you can take aspirin, and, and its cousins are the mainstay of medical treatment. Yes? How much aspirin? So I'm a simple guy. My simple answer is don't take more than it says on the bottle. <laughs> See my receptionist. What, what was that? Yeah, good, good. So aspirin's pretty much aspirin, but generic is just as good as the fancier ones that have like arthritis or bufferin and some of them have caffeine or other things in them. Basic old-fashioned aspirin. In general, you don't want to take more than probably six or eight over-the-counter version aspirins a day. What about the 81? Well, 81 is, is, a, is basically about a quarter of a regular one. That's for heart protection. If you're taking it, take it every day. Don't forget. Forget the other stuff, but don't forget that one. Your doctor has you on it for a reason. Trust me, I'm, I know about that one. Okay? But that's a little low, and it's below the level that will probably help much with arthritis. So you're at that 325. That's the go to any pharmacy. Look up aspirin, 325. One to maybe eight of those at most a day. That may be too much for you, but that's what it says on the bottle. That's what the FDA said was safe. Okay? All right. Yes, real quick one, yeah. We're going to talk about that. That's a really good one. Excellent. We're going to talk about that whole spectrum. That's sort of under the health and behavioral mod stuff. We're going to talk about that in just a sec. Great question. And then the last one, which will be the balance of our talk on surgery. So symptom suppression. This is not very exciting, quite honestly. I thought I was going to come and learn about the answer to osteoarthritis. We haven't got one, not medically anyway. So less pain. Symptom suppression through activity moderation. So you use a golf cart for half of your golf at first. You walk a little less. You start being on a stationary bicycle. You do your exercise in water, gravity-shared exercise. On a bicycle or water, some of your weight is buoyed up by the seat or by the water. You can still be active, burn calories, get some fitness, some enjoyment, exercise, get the brain moving in the water, get it going. But it's lower impact because you you're have to. you losing internal shock absorption. You have to think about that as you live your life. Shoes with good shock absorption. Exercise in areas that ab absorb some of the shock. Guess what? If shock absorption loss is part of the problem, then weight loss is probably a pretty good idea. And if you look up in the Cochrane Collaborative, the best collation of all science around the medical treatment of osteoarthritis, two things are shown to actually work. Aspirin-type products and weight loss. That's not very sexy either, but those are the fundamental parts of a medical treatment plan for osteoarthritis for problems with lower extremity joints. You can share load with a cane or a walker. 
fall prevention share load. So for me, my deteriorating hip, at first I loved hiking. I couldn't hike. I started using a walking stick. Walking in the woods, oh, this is cool, good balance. And I kind of need this now. And the hip pain was getting worse and worse and worse. And then I was starting to use a cane just to get around the ranch, you know. That's sort of a bummer at 53, right? Don't want to do that. So, but that's how you share the loads to less the pain, symptom suppression, activity moderation, weight loss, cane, and some medication. Medication over the counter, acetaminophen, Tylenol used to be used widely for osteoarthritis pain. Quite effective, too. I mean, if you take enough of it, it helps. But even the simplest thing like Tylenol has now got some red flags that many of you are probably aware of. So we don't think about any of these medicines as totally benign anymore. Even, you know, Advil. Advil has some cardiac risk, some GI risk. Advil? We live on Advil in, the, in North America. Well, not anymore because we have to think about some of those balances. Okay? Is that making sense? We're talking about symptom suppression. Yes? Yeah. Very interesting. It's a very hot topic right now. Clearly helps with moderate level pain of all different disorders. No question. Maybe Vermont should be a center of studying that type of thing. Lots of issues to think about there. In very interesting. <laughs> so medic what are the spectrum of medications for osteoarthritis? Well, I've touched on aspirin. It's inexpensive. If taken with food in your stomach, quite safe. Ibuprofen, that's the generic name for Advil. And naproxen, the generic name for Aleve. So Aleve and Advil. Coke and Pepsi, they're pretty similar. They're a little different in the, if you look under, under the microscope, but basically pretty similar stuff. These, this class of medicines, a little bit more powerful perhaps than aspirin, but a lot more risk when it comes to the cardiac side. We worry about cardiac because the same people who suffer from arthritis suffer from heart disease, many of us. Okay. And there's the Tylenol one with a little bit of red flag. Tylenol is not evil. It's not terrible. It won't kill you if you use some Tylenol. But for certain people, you have to watch the amount you take. So that's a conversation with your primary care doc. Okay. So this is a change. If I gave this talk 15 years ago, we didn't put a little caution flag up for medication. But we have to. That's important. That's an important take home from the med school class. Uh, vitamins and nutritional supplements. Boy, we would love if this was the answer. Building blocks of cartilage. What can I eat, drink, smoke, take, snort, whatever that's going to keep me from having this problem? I don't want this problem, okay? But we now unfortunately know in well-done studies that are not authored by the company that makes the stuff. <laughs> this, is a, this is a bonus question. What two countries in the world allow direct-to-consumer advertising for medical products? The United States of America and New Zealand. Every other country forbids direct-to-consumer advertising. By the way, you're getting some of that tonight from Fletcher Allen, just so you know. But, but forbids it because it's not healthy, actually, to have that. So there's a tremendous amount of bias in the research. And I'm biased towards, I have my bias, right? I'm orthopedic surgeon, warning surgeon, right? But, but this, this is a very important part of healthcare, I'm sure. But for osteoarthritis, the data is not good. I wish it was. I'd love it if something simple, safe, and not terribly expensive worked well for my patients, believe me. But it's not glucosamine and chondroitin. About the same as a sugar pill, so that's good. That means it's not harmful, and placebo effect is very real. You hear about that all the time in community med school. Some, when the industry publishes the papers, there's a little. But if you look at the best gate study, this is 10,000 people each arm, big study, no benefits, meaning not any better than Tylenol or aspirin. Yeah, that's a great one. I heard that. Haven't mentioned Celebrex. I did kind of really quickly. Celebrex is like a mega ibuprofen. It's, it's a formulated, stronger. It's a little different class. It's called a COX-2 specific non-steroidal. And with the supervision of your primary care doctor might be the next choice after aspirin if aspirin's not good enough. But it comes with risks. You gotta, that's not just, oh, Orthopedic surgeon write lots of prescriptions for Celebrex. Not a good idea. We, it would be nice, but it's not a good idea. It has to be done very careful conversation with your primary care doc. But it's in that same family of 
of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Good, I'm glad you spoke up, thank you. So this is another one that worries me a little bit. The, drug, the companies that make this stuff has no FDA oversight over the supplements, so be very careful about what you're getting. Who do you ask that question to? It's not the internet, by the way, because the internet's trying to sell you stuff. Probably your pharmacist is your best person to say, you have this in your store. Is this made in Guadalajara? I need to worry about it. Is this a good company and brand? Ask your pharmacist, seriously. Okay. Alternative medicine, so questions about acupuncture or other options. There's clearly a role for symptom suppression in using some of the complementary approaches I'm going to talk about. There is clearly no role for the long-term management or altering the course of osteoarthritis. So it does not keep you from having progression, but it may help you with your symptoms and may help you along with an aspirin protocol or using aspirin daily or using a medicine like aspirin, the Celebrex family, your pool exercise program, and maybe some of the complementary strategies are a good choice. And here's sort of the list that the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and the NIH publishes the alternative medicine things that are at least considered in osteoarthritis care for the hip or knee. So biofeedback, hypnosis, yoga, tai chi, great for fall prevention, great for flexibility and strength if you can do it. There's acupuncture. Certainly has traditionally had a role in, in, in helping people with the knee pain associated with arthritis quite a bit and other joints. Unfortunately, this month in the, in the British Journal, there's a big article that's saying acupuncture is really not, not effective. So that's a bummer because I, I, I'd like to think that I've been using evidence to advise my patients, but now the evidence on acupuncture is not so great. But that doesn't mean we don't try things. Remember, we have not got a cure for this problem. So if it's safe, it's probably not harmful at all to try, and acupuncture is a good example. I, I've, I've had some acupuncture for myself. I, use, I prescribe or recommend acupuncture for patients who've had trouble, can't tolerate the medicines, aren't doing well in the current um, sort of Western medicine ideas, we'll use acupuncture. So some of these things can affect these parameters of osteoarthritis. Because when you have osteoarthritis and you can't do the things you want to do with your kids or your grandkids or your animals or your wife or hiking or whatever, Believe me, there is a significant component of fatigue and depression, and it's a bump because this is robbing you of your good years. And so we, it's appropriate to be thinking about anything that helps you with the whole patient, not just the knee pain. And I think that may be more the role for alternative medicine here. Exercise. Everyone asks and should, what's the role of exercise? Exercise is really good for staying healthy but it's kind of tough on the weight-bearing joints. So hill climbing may be tough in the knee patient. Riding the bicycle may not have enough bending. Running may be a little tough on the joint for the hip and knee, but there are alternatives. We talked about pool and cycling to lower the loads if appropriate. There are some do's, warm up, cool down, not, again, not rocket science again, but any exercise program for osteoarthritis and sore joints should be when you feel your best, when you're not tired, and when you, and at, your medicine is sort of at the peak of its effectiveness. Ty, aspirin, Tylenol, their peak effect is a couple hours after you take it. So if you're going to time your daily exercise, think that as part of your strategy, okay? But you can overdo it just like anything else. And if you have some of these warning signs, you're probably doing too much. This is the take home for me. If it hurts more than two hours, if it continues to hurt, so it hurt while you were doing the exercise and you're still hurting a couple hours later, you overdid it. The joint was not ready for that. They should take as a learning opportunity, don't make that regimen, that intensity, that frequency as part of your exercise again. So sustain discomfort after. I'm not talking about I had a good workout and two days later I'm a little sore and that goes away. That's probably a good workout. But if it's hurting during and for hours after your exercise, that was not a good blend of exercise for you. Okay? Two-thirds of the way through, we're pretty much on time. We're going to move on to the next section unless there's a pressing question about the medical treatment. Yes? So if you... Just going back to that last slide, mm -hmm. if you have continued pain, you're not doing any additional harm to the joint, are you? Well, that's, that's really a great question. And the answer is over and over and over and over again with a swollen knee or a swollen stiff hip, it's probably doing some more damage. But you know, if you go out and try it for a week and I've got this new yoga routine or this new my personal trainer gave me a new exercise and I try that and my knee sore for one or two weeks, you probably didn't do a lot of damage. You just got into that clinical pain inflammation cycle that we need to now suppress again. Good question. Okay? Okay. So 
Now we'll talk about the goals of the surgical treatment. We've learned about the diagnosis. We've learned about the spectrum of medical options onto the spectrum of surgical options. The goal for surgery is the same as the goal for medical treatment. Relieve pain, restore function, and keep mobility or improve mobility. But here's the challenge. I want my hip and knee pain gone, and I don't want the hassle factor of surgery. Give me something else. Well, we now see that the something else is pretty limited when it comes to osteoarthritis. It's joint protection, medication to suppress the symptoms, activity moderation. So why is, these are the questions we should have as we approach the subject. Why is surgery recommended? It basically is a simple answer. Failure of comprehensive non-surgical management. We've tried the other stuff. You're not happy. What else should we talk about? Well, you don't talk about surgery when there isn't a surgical fix. Osteoarthritis of the hip and knee has a surgical fix. So that's why we would broach this conversation. What are the alternatives? That's the medical treatment model we've talked about. What are the benefits of surgery and how long? In general, patients report happiness with surgery for a long time. I know that sounds a little simple, but when it comes right down to it, that's what we're looking for. Sustained pain relief, restored function and joy of life for more than hours to weeks. That's what in medication and in injection form can give us, a cortisone shot. That'll give us a couple weeks for the trip to Europe that I wanted to do and I've always been saving for and now my husband and I can do it and we're off. And I can get you probably some symptom suppression with a cortisone shot. Probably, probably count on that actually for a few days or a few weeks, but not any long lasting. It really takes a surgical treatment for long time improvement. Duration of recovery kind of depends on your fitness going in, but in general, hip and knee surgery takes about a season to get over. It's just a nice, easy thing to remember. We have much more conversation in the office if we chose to, but it's about, a, it's about three or four months. And you're through this big event, now a long-term improvement in your problem. Assistance at home, how long? Depends on your fitness and level of independence beforehand. In some respects, surgery, once we get to that point, sooner is better than later. If your cardiovascular fitness fails and your bone health osteoporosis fails, going worse, and it's actually harder to have a good long-term solution surgically. Is there disability after surgery? Of course. How long? Depends on your job. Disability means I can't do my job. Typically, a sit-down worker is back at work in two to four weeks. A uh, laborer is back at eight to 12 weeks after joint replacement, okay? Physical therapy, is that an important part? Absolutely more important before than immediately after, so prehab is really important and the joint school class teaches us a lot about that in our visit. Return to normal activity when your hip or knee is ready. That's a cop out, right? Well, actually, it's the most important answer because everybody's knee's a little different. So I can't tell you golf's at six weeks for every hip or every knee. I do know that earlier than that's probably too early for the biology, no matter how good you feel. And we'll talk about some of the things we do to make it easier to have joint replacement, but there's still a biologic clock that has to happen underneath the skin that you can't really see that has to go on after we have to respect. So here's the $50,000 question. If I've got osteoarthritis that limits my lifestyle more than I'm willing to put up with and I've exhausted the full spectrum, what's the best option? Well, the conversation we'll have, we're talking about hip and knee now, let's use knee as an example. Do I have to replace the whole knee? Isn't there something less surgically you could do to help me along the way? Well, it depends on how we answer these three questions. What are your goals? How far along is your disease when we talk about the surgical treatment and for the destruction of the joint? And how stiff is your knee? Those are the three questions because we can alter the type of procedure we do based on our answer to those questions. 95% of people who make the decision to have knee replacement have involvement of the whole knee, not just one little part. That's just the way this disease is. So that means if we only replace part of it, you're not going to get the full benefit. So that's why 95% of joint replacements worldwide, United States, North America, Canada, Spain, pick one, total knee replacement. That means resurfacing the bone ends. Here's that arthritic picture we saw before for continuity. We replace with metal and plastic. Ah, I don't want anything to do with this. Okay, but you've worn out the joint. To be a little mechanical, if your car wore out its right front tire and it was bald, you'd probably replace it sooner or later. That's a little mechanical for most of us to think about our bodies, but that's really what it is. It's a shock absorption problem. So total knee is our most effective treatment. 
for long-term relief when the whole knee is involved, which is 95% of patients. It can be improved over time. Parts of the knee replacement can wear out, and we can change them, which is hard to believe, but they're modular, meaning we can put new parts in. The disadvantage to the best long-term treatment we have for joint arthritis of the knee, the disadvantage is the investment it takes to recover from. And that's where a lot of the work is happening right now in knee replacement. We have an operation that works. It's just a hassle to go through it. How do we make that better? We'll talk about that a little bit. So just a short course version. Here are the kinds of things we put into the body. We have a thigh bone part, a shin bone part, and a kneecap part. Big surprise. Those are the three shiny white bearing surfaces that have worn down. Those are the ones we need to replace. The surgeon removes about six millimeters to nine millimeters, millimeters of bone on the upper end of the shin bone upper end of the, and the end of the thigh bone, the back side of the kneecap, put on the metal and plastic surfaces, and that's knee replacement. It's not cut out the knee mid-tibia mid and put somebody else's in there, which is what <laughs> a lot of people think very understandably. The naming of the procedure is not pretty good. It ought to be knee resurfacing, I guess, but it's not what the inventors called it in the Hospital for Special Surgery in 1963. So here we are. That's what it's called. Oops, sorry about that. So we resurface the back side of the kneecap, resurface the end of thigh bone and shin bone. Those are the parts. Okay? So do I have, there's my question, Doc. Do I still really have to, I don't want to replace the whole part. I want something less. Well, it depends. In a low demand setting, this person is not, not out in the workforce anymore. The simple walk around lifestyle, having pain at rest at night and just walking. It can do partial knee replacement if the injury is limited to one area and the knee still bends well and the ligaments are intact. That's no more than 5% of patients by the time I see you. Because everyone says, the last thing I want to do is come talk to somebody about surgery. Well, if the knee has progressed in its disease, we've lost the opportunity to do a lesser invasive procedure. That's a little bit of a take home. Okay, so partial joint replacement covers only what is currently worn out. So it's called uni or partial. We can just do part of the end of the thigh bone, leave the kneecap alone. We can just do the kneecap, just resurface the kneecap, depending on what part of the three parts of the knee is worn out. Partial joint replacement, we have been doing it for about 30 years. Eight out of 10 patients, 80% at 10 years, still using the original parts. Remember that number. Eight out of 10 at 10 years, that's partial knee replacement. We use this mainly for the very young, or the folks who are, are quite a bit older, well over 75, less invasive. They don't really, they're not out logging in the woods anymore. They just need to be comfortable to go down street and be with their grandchildren and live independently. So partial knee replacement has a role. But again, as I said, over 90%, it's really 90 to 95% total knee. It's the right treatment because all three parts of the knee are worn out. And that experience typically is at 15 years 95% of patients are still happy and using the same part, so it's much better than 80% 80, 80 at 10 years. This is a more durable solution for you. How about the hip? Same questions. What are your goals for surgery? How far along is it? In this case, not so much the stiffness, but have you lost length? Length, and that's very common to lose length when the bone ends have lost their cartilage cap. Here's hip replacement. Again, it's not the whole thing, but it's, here's the pictures to show you. The disease involves the bone and the cartilage, so we remove that segment. The surgeon makes your rough and ready shallow socket into a clean, deep socket through a little cheese grater reamer here. Orthopedics and our toys, we love our toys. It's good for the shop. And we put in a metal socket into the bony pelvis. We prepare the thigh bone by chiseling the inside of what is already hollow and making it a perfect match to the implant we put in. So when you're all done, we've got an implant in the thigh bone. We put a head of various sizes and lengths to adjust your lost limb length. And we put it all together as a hip replacement, OK? Outcomes at one year. This is important. This is, these are the questions. So I'm going to go through all this. I'm going to spend a season. I'm going to take the risk of surgery, the time lost work, and all that. How good am I going to be? This is the national data in the United States, and ours here at, at Fletcher Allen. 95% of, of men one year, say, I'm very happy with what's going on. My pain is totally tolerable or I don't have any. I'm back at work. My goals of surgery were met or exceeded. That's hard to exceed, uh, but that's what we're shooting for. And in women, for knee, it's about 85%. We don't know yet why women aren't happier with their knee replacements all the time, every time. 
probably has something to do with anatomy that's different for women and men, but we don't fully understand that. We're working a lot of research on trying to sort some of that out on what we do, but that's what it is. But here's the news that is sort of the most helpful. That again, unlike the pill, the cortisone shot is something that will help for a decade and a half or longer. If the small percent of patients at 15 years have worn out or loosened the parts, we can do it again. I don't really want to do that. Well, sometimes we have to, to keep moving again. And of those patients who have to have an upgrade, nice way to think about it, the, to new parts, that again, at 10 years, they're still doing well for eight out of 10 patients. So patients tend to be a little happier with their hips. I have patients come back to the office at four months, and they say, which hip did you do, doc? That's not kidding. I'm not kidding. At knee, they know exactly what knee I did. And they're still getting better at four months. So that data, without 15 years, is for hip and knee survivorship. That doesn't mean that they have no discomfort, but they're using the same parts we put in 15 years ago. Got that? Does that answer your question? Cool. Here's something that's all the rage for a while, right? Hip resurfacing. Just change the socket and keep the diseased upper end of the ball, but shape it to accept a metal cap so you have metal rubbing on metal. This is an example of orthopedics trying to solve a big problem. We did not solve it. We didn't solve it in 1940 when we tried this. We didn't solve it in 1960 when we tried this. And we didn't solve it in 2000 when we tried it. So we do not yet have the metallurgy right or the ability to just cap the end of the bone. Hip resurfacing at all, it was a big buzzword all the time about five, six, seven years ago. Really, the bloom is off that rose, not something we use except in the very, very special cases now. And there may be people in the audience who have one, and we need to keep an eye on you with blood tests for the metals that are part of the problem here. So that's, we have an alert mechanism for, we did, only did a handful of these at the University of Vermont. Someplace not too far away did an awful lot of them. A lot of them have been changed to total hip. I think we have six patients total at this point. We're watching every one of them every year. So far, we're doing OK. Minimally invasive. Everybody wants to talk about, OK, well, now I failed my non-surgical management. I want to have surgery, but I want it to be really easy. I don't want it to be painful. I don't want it to take a long time. I don't want to have this biologic clock. I just want it to be quick and easy and over with. I certainly did, I can assure you. Well, that, th this is what we're trying to do orthopedically to improve. So we have smaller incisions with more direct routes for the hip, these two, mini posterior and direct anterior, and for the knee, something called quad split mid vastus. For the residents, we're training them in all of these six different techniques, but largely the minimally invasive or less invasive promise is less pain, less blood loss. That's important, less infection risk, less stiffness and scarring, and maybe a more rapid recovery. And that's true. We have made big inroads here and everywhere around Dartmouth and Albany and Chicago and people that do this work. It's definitely better than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It's not a chip shot. It's not a wall in the park to have a hip or knee replacement, but it's certainly getting better. There's a really common question. Well, what about me then? Am I a candidate for minimally invasive surgery? Well, maybe isn't everybody? The answer is clearly no. <clears throat> when you try to do good work through a small hole, guess what? It doesn't work out right all the time. You have to be able to see to do good carpentry, to do good work here. So minimally invasive is not for everybody. This is the most important variable. Is your weight and height proportional? Because the heavier you are, the more difficult it is to try to do any of the minimally invasive procedures well. Quite honestly, it may be two or three weeks quick recovery from a minimally invasive than a little more traditional way. But if the implants don't have the right positioning, then you don't get that 95% 15-year survivorship promise that you want. You want a long-term cure for this problem. So we have to be careful about minimally invasive. We've been doing all of the minimally invasive techniques here since the 1990s. Jim Howe really pioneered several of them. Nobody around here knows that, quite honestly. But because uh, we've been, UVM and Fletcher Allen don't boast a lot about stuff like that. But I think Jim has just retired and is a major contribution to that science worldwide, actually. He did some really good work. Muscle mass, big muscular men. If the tissues are really poor quality or if they're really, really stiff going in, hip or knee, then the minimally invasive techniques just probably aren't right for you. Your chances of having a problem go up the smaller the approach. So that's really the surgeon's expertise and experience base you have to, you have to trust. You have to think about those, have those conversations and trust, okay? So what are some of the other things we're doing? We're coming to the end here. We're right at the top of the hour. What are some of the other things we do to try to make this good operation called joint replacement, which is the surgical part 
of the management of our osteoarthritis last a long time. Well, the parts that rubbed together wore down the first time. That's why you had osteoarthritis. We want to do something to try to keep them from wearing down again as you're active through the years living with the joint replacement. So better materials, the advancement to ceramics and oxidized zirconia, some of the materials that Fletcher Allen ha has available. Most a lot of hospitals don't in Vermont. It's more expensive to share with the patients. Doesn't no cost passed along to the patient. It's just their limited release of the products to the to some of the uh, uh, academic centers. So maybe better bearing surfaces will last longer. We certainly see they do in the laboratory. Will they last longer in me or in you? We'll see as we go forward. But very promising. Make the joint replacement last longer with better materials. It makes sense. Technology continues to improve in the knee. We have better polyethylene shape and material, smoother, more durable surfaces to work with, and the promise potentially of even not some, of, of using, putting the implants in without the bone grout in between. We have some experience with that. Doing that here, which was troubled at first, and the science is still improving on it, but advancing the materials and how we put them in. So, as I lead this division now, I have two associates, as you may know, Dr. Nathan Elms and Dr. Michael Blankstein. We have focused on a couple of things, patient safety and medical preoperative operation, medical pre-surgical preparation to bring you to the environment of the surgical suite as healthy as you can. That's our primary focus. That's the work I've been doing the last six years here with our team. This is another area that I'm particularly interested in, which is instruments that are made for you so that my carpentry is more reliable. It's really important, especially as we're trying to do it through smaller holes and less invasive, super important. One bandwagon we haven't really jumped on at all yet is because there's not much evidence to support it is that not only are the instruments made for you, but the implants are made for you. And there's some of that going on nearby, and I'm not a fan of it. I'm trying to educate the residents about it and keeping a, sort of a close watch on that, we'll see. But pre-navigation, making the instruments that help me do the procedure, all of us do the procedure for the knee, for example, are made pre-op off MRI and X-ray, allow us to smaller incision, no drill holes in the bone in the canals, less blood loss, quite dramatic, less blood loss. So the promise or hope of custom instrument instrumentation is we get the balancing and alignment just right. We don't have to violate the bone, which increases risk of blood clot and things. Less invasive, we hope. It is a little smaller incision, but I don't think that's the big thing. And most importantly, more accurate alignment of the implants so they last as long as they can. Because if you get malaligned when you have your own knee, it wears out faster, bow-legged or knock knee. A few millimeters off when we put in the components can make a difference in survivorship of the implant. So that's where we're trying to focus our push in the envelope a little bit so we have more of a reliable outcome so we don't have as many outliers you know, we don't have any variation. We're being as standardized as we can in putting in the implants with the best carpentry every time. So patient-specific instrumentation, trying to reduce those outliers. Okay, finally, patient-specific implants. I talked about, about a little bit. It sounds like a really good idea. It may be the best someday, but right now, as the technology is here, you use technology to actually make the jigs and the implants. It's quite a bit more expensive. Um, it has the same preference of less invasive that the instruments do, certainly more expensive, but you have only one implant to work with. You don't have the 720 combinations I have in the operating room every time I do a total knee replacement with custom instruments but off-the-shelf in implants. I think that's important. And so far, we've not seen any long-term benefit improvement over joint replacement. So I think patient-specific implants is still a question mark in my practice and our practice here at UVM. Well, as I said, we have focused a lot on infection prevention, blood clot prevention, and a standardized pre- and post-exercise program that has lowered the infection rate here to just basically the lowest in the United States now is just given an award for it. It's very, very low at less than one, really zero percent. I hate saying that because it'll probably be tomorrow. But we basically have a very, very low infection rate over the last years because we worked hard on it. Blood clot prevention strategies and standardized rehab plan is a big part of it. The future, where do we go? It can't possibly be the best answer is cobalt, chrome, and plastic put in my joint. That can't be the best we can do. It's clearly not. The answer will be something like biologic replacement of the cartilage. Uh, it's coming. 
uh, a colleague at, at the NIH right now has the biggest work going on. I've, I reviewed his presentation at the American Association at the Knee Surgeons Conference. He's going to be one of the keynote speakers at our annual meeting this year. We're getting there. But in my lifetime and your lifetime, I don't think we're going to be capping your arthritic joint with something we grew in a Petri dish. I wish we were, believe me. But um, I don't think that's going to happen. Cell-based care is right around the corner. We are many other types of arthritis do have a cell-based solution. In other words, a biologic injection will alter it. But it's not going to grow new cartilage on the end of the joint. So we're probably still talking about <clears throat> healing with metal and plastic for the joint replacement patient for the hip or knee for now. Okay? Um, some of these resources uh, are listed in your handouts, and we're pretty much on time to start our, our Q&A, if that's okay, and we'll, we'll go from there. I, I'm gonna, I think we're due to stay till 7.30, but we can stay at uh, whatever works for everybody. It's nice and cool in here. So, Jennifer, thanks for the opportunity to present, and I think it's part of the Sort of the timing. When, when do we pull, pull the trigger here? Should I wait as long as I possibly can and then have a knee replacement? Or we just use knee as the example here, same conversation along with that. Or should I um, uh, come in early and maybe have a less invasive procedure called partial knee replacement? It kind of depends on what's your history. It goes back to that listening thing again. Guys, listening thing again. It's really important, okay? If you had a traumatic event, to one part of your joint. You broke your kneecap and Tom Christensen fixed it for you a number of years ago and now the arthritis has set in. That patient has a better chance of having a long-term solution with partial knee replacement because they had an, an event that caused destruction of the joint surface and they're not genetically programmed to have the whole rest of the knee wear out. They might be, but at least we know we have this early, very worn out, in your case, kneecap joint. That's a great reason. So if you've had a specific traumatic injury, a crack in the bone, a known cartilage removed years ago arthroscopically by Bob Johnson or something, you know, he's one of the legends around here. <clears throat> if that's the case, that, then I would urge you to come in a little bit earlier, not just when you're just barely getting into the office, but earlier. Because that's the patient who doesn't have global osteoarthritis of their whole knee and could pop, perhaps be best served by the, a partial replacement. Whereas the patient who is, my thumbs are stiff, my knees, my shoulders, my hips, my toes, I've got osteoarthritis all over the place, that patient's probably never going to be a good candidate for partial knee replacement because they're genetically programmed to have diseased cartilage. Sorry about that. And if I just replace one part that's the worst right now, it won't take very long for the rest to catch up. But that's a pretty high-level conversation that we need to have in the office about those particulars. But it's a good question because it raises that question, what about the trigger? When do I do this? And the old mantra was, when you can't walk anymore, you come and see me. Well, that's when knee replacement was 21 days in the hospital and a year recovery. And that's when I was a resident here, that's what it looked like. I can assure you, you know, we were making rounds for two and a half weeks on hip replacement patients here. Now you go home the day and a half or two days later and you're up and moving and I want you moving. So the, the, the risk and downtime is not zero, but it's shorter. So it's at least reasonable to come in before you're really hobbling. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Yes. If a patient comes to you and they're having a hip pain and you're assuming that it's uh, osteoarthritis because you do an x-ray, yep. there's still a fair amount of cartilage and you're wondering, well, what's going on? Would you order an MRI? And if so, what would you expect to see? Yes, great question. So everybody hear the question? Okay. 
So it's a dilemma, right? It's a diagnostic dilemma. When, when orthopedics is easy, it's easy when it's a dilemma. We have to use other things. So first is I would go right back to the history. Did I miss something? Did I, did I capture all of the important history? Would we explore your history further of your symptoms, their onset, the nature, number one. Number two is I'm going to uh, focus in on the physical examination even again. I'm going to go back to the simple stuff, quite honestly. Because everything that hurts in the groin clearly is not hip arthritis. It can be hernia. It can be female organ problems. It can be a slip disc at the lumbar one level. It can be a kidney problem and hurt right here, okay? So we have to really just go back to history and physical. But if no clear solution in, in that workup emerges, yes, then we would then use advanced imaging. That would typically be an MRI scan, and it would be an MRI scan with dye in the joints. And so now it's an invasive test, which is not the most fun, but some things we need to do sometimes to really outline the tissue. Because x-ray, quite honestly, is not good at finding focal, local destruction of a joint. You kind of have to lose the whole surface of one end of the bone in order for it to approach the other bone and show as a loss of joint space on x-ray. I can cut out a whole big piece of your cartilage, like a die punch on the end of your thigh bone, put it standing x-ray, it still looks good because the shoulders next to it are still have good thick cartilage on it. So MRI with die helps me look for the subtleties that x-ray may not show. But I'm actually first going to worry about, have I even got the joint right? Is, it, is this bowel? Is it is it ovaries? Is this uterus? Is it intestine? Is it spine? And that's history and physical. It's really, really important. OK? Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes? So um, let's just say a few years ago when I was 15, I had no one alone in my x-ray. And the doctor at the time said, you're too young to have your knee replaced. You need to wait until the pain is really bad. Yeah. So basically for me right now, when the weather is off, <laughs> I'm in pain. Have, what, has anything changed in, over the period of time? And the reason why they just want to replace my knee is they said, just, hey, I was too young, and I would have to have it replaced after a period of time. So my question is, has, has any, is there more longevity to the replacement parts? And, Yes, really good question, and a very, very common question. I'm sure there are plenty of people who are struggling with that same, same question in the audience, so I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, things have changed. Advanced materials, better metals, better plastic, better surgical technique, better balancing of the joint, if we use the knee for that example, uh, super important. Uh, so yes, all of that has improved. I, I, really I struggle with this for a long time in my practice, trying to think about this, this very same question to help my patients. The problem is, is that surgeons are perfectionists. We hate failure. So we define failure, right? We define failure as 5%. So if I have a patient, you know, so, so that means that I want 95% of my patients or more to never need what I do again. That's a really high bar when you think about medical surgical treatments. So the younger you are, the longer you can be running around on it to wear it out another, to wear the new one out, right? So that's why you're too young, which is ridiculous, because you could be dead three years from now from some other medical thing <laughs> and have not had any joy of life. So, but that's a trade-off, okay? You gotta think about that. It's easy to talk about here, but it's tougher in the office, I can show you. So I don't think people are too young. I don't want this to be a take-home message that we should do knee replacement early, because we should not, or hip replacement. But we have surgical solutions to your problem to help you live your life better now. Are you going to need, if I, do, am I going to need my hip replaced in the future? 53, hip replaced. Guaranteed I'm going to need more parts. But I am sleeping and walking and playing and enjoying my life now, and that's really important. So if I need new parts 15 to 20 years ago, it's about 1% per year. 20 years out, about 20% of people need new parts. 30 years out, about 30% of people need new parts with the new stuff. So there has been change. So the conversation is actually harder because we have longer, more durable solutions and we have younger patients in North America with higher expectations. That's the tension. So we, we do visit that question every day in the office. And I think just 
wait as long as you can till you can't tolerate anymore, which oftentimes means cardiovascular problems, depression, and isolation from your social environment. I think that's too long. We at least ought to talk about it. Yes, and then we'll go right here. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just had a question about the ceramic hip replacement. Yes. So my surgeon said that um, they're a little more vulnerable to hard blows, like if I was in a car accident or jumped off a ladder. Yep. Sure, that's a great question. Did anybody, everybody hear the question? Okay, so I'm gonna put it in basically two categories. One is the bearing surface, the stuff that hits each other, and then it sounded like the other was surgical approach, which is in other words, which way? Okay, good, great question. So we're on to hip now, not knee, it's focused on knee because there's no ceramic knee or anything like that at this point. Um, so we choose and should choose the use of a bearing surface other than Metal on polyethylene. So the standard around the world clearly is really good metal on really good polyethylene, acrylic. That's the standard. We should choose doing something other than that gold standard really carefully. And the two other choices are ceramic on ceramic or metal on metal. There are a few other little nuances, but that's for another day. Metal on metal has not worked out well with Ions of metal in the bloodstream that affect brain, heart, liver, kidney. We are not going down the path of metal on metal anymore. Maybe again someday, but not now. That doesn't mean we don't occasionally have a patient that, that is the right thing for, but it's very specific. So your question was ceramic on ceramic. Probably the best solution. But they break. Badness. We don't like breakage on things. And when ceramic breaks, it can break into a billion pieces. That's a problem for the next joint replacement parts that have to go in. So again, the selection of anything other than metal on poly needs to be a very select population of patients, very specific. And we have in-depth conversations about that in the office. It's beyond the scope of today. But I hope that meets your question there. A surgical approach. I think surgical approach is important. It's part of the, of the journey we're on to learning how to do joint replacement as safely and as reliably as possible with as least downtime. I think the, we're, we're on the learning curve as a country about direct anterior, which is the, one of the new ways to do hip replacement. Actually, not that new. It's been around for years. It's just been reinvented, quite honestly, with a $100,000 table. I've got some pictures of them if you want to see it. Um, and, uh, and, and I think duh is the best way to approach the hip replacement insertion of parts in the specific population that are best served by that. So that's another conversation in the office, that height and weight balance that we talked about, the muscle mass, the stiffness of the joint, and the degree of deformity. So there's no way one solution is the best for everybody. Does that answer your question? Yes, I can. And next question. Yes. And then we'll go up here. Well, that, why is the red? Yeah. So uh, they actually probably weren't because physical therapists are the number ones against direct lateral approach because that's the one that actually goes through and detaches muscle permanently. Yeah, that, that's the one we're talking about. So it's okay. We'll, we can talk a little bit more about the nuance. But the reason why it was in red there to answer your question is it's the one that's probably off the list of the minimally invasive, which is what that slide was talking about. Because that's a good way to do hip replacement, but it's not the minute one of the minimally invasive techniques and has a little more likelihood of some limp and formation of extra bone in the hip that we can avoid by one of the other two ways we do it. We teach all of these to the residents, so we're all comfortable in how to do all the, there's actually five ways to do it, but uh, the majority are done through two. two how about over here? Yes, sir. Ma'am, see that. Can you um, comment on the exercises again in terms of um, knee pain and I know you had hip pain and you said that you would people hiking uphill and the pain going down the hill? Biking, uh, sort of biking versus bike. Yep. So I, the slide there, uh, did everybody hear the question? Okay, about exercising. Sure. So I think that if you can perform the activity you want to choose, let's say it's hiking, and you can do that, and you're a little sore while you do it, but it doesn't last long after, and your knee doesn't swell, then that's not a bad form of exercise. 
But if your body is telling you you overdid it and you do it over and over and over again, swollen, stiff knee, pay for it days, lots more Advil or aspirin, and you're really troubled by it, then I think you should pull that out of your repertoire. I can't tell you whether uphill or downhill is going to be a problem for you. You're going to tell me that when I listen to you, if I ask the right questions and find out. Because there's just too much biodiversity in the human to know which one's going to be tolerated. But in general, if your shock absorption internally is down, things you can do to lower the load and cyclical load help. That's why a bicycle is a good idea. You tell me whether a recline bike's any better than a regular bike. I don't know for your anatomy, your endurance, it, it, your flexibility, with just a sort of trial and error there. Yeah, and that's where working with a personal trainer or physical therapist who has access to a variety of types of things, you can sort of learn there and see what's best for you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Young age range, 14 to 21 or so. Yep. Um, what are you recommending? Personally, we've had many knee surgeries in our family. ACL we constructed a several pounds of um, And knee problems, we were seeing knee replacements possibly in the future. But I'm just kind of wondering how bad does that have to be before you're going to recommend a young person at the age of 22 to 25 having a knee replacement? Yeah. So, um, the ultra young, that's a whole other conversation. And there is a population of ultra young, under 30 or 40, disabled people, whether it's sports disabled, work disabled, joy disabled. So I don't think age is the barrier. It, it, it's do they have a high level of pain, high level of disability, physical examination that fits, radiographic evidence of severe bone on bone, not just a little, this needs to be end stage disease when you convert to this idea of not medical management and lifestyle adaptation, but surgical replacement. O only because we haven't got a lifelong solution for joint replacement. And the ultra young patient may be looking at three or four revision procedures over the next 70 years. And there is a, there is a point where we have to think very cautiously about it. But that is, that's not a one hour office visit. That's getting to know each other, trying a multitude of things medical, physio, medication, injection, bracing, lifestyle that change, so that you stay active, but you're not really wearing the joint excessively. We do know that if you have an ACL and meniscus injury, whether you repair it or not, it doesn't alter the future of arthritis. It may make your knee more stable and better today, but it doesn't actually alter the future. Great question. Yes, sir. Very patient, sorry. <coughs> Absolutely right. Great. Did everybody, did everybody hear that? The role? Great. Okay, sorry. So the question was, uh, I have spoken primarily about, given the time constraints, the surgical procedure, and we talked about prehabilitation and rehabilitation afterwards. His question is, how much of the benefit that you get at 1 in 15 years from hip or knee replacement comes from the rehabilitation afterwards in concert with the surgery. They go together. They, can, they, they must go together, especially in me. Hip replacement patients, when you restore the alignment of the joint and resurface the bone ends, you are probably 80% of the way there. You, yes, you should work on an exercise program. And yes, you need to keep that up for a while to get to the max benefit of it, which is not normal, but a lot better for a long time. That's hip replacement. In fact, in many countries in the United States, you're given a piece of paper. I'm not, not in the United States. Many countries other than the United States, the total joint replacement patients get a piece of paper. Say, go do your exercises, because we know we're so confident with hip replacement that you'll do OK. Very low cost. Patients about the same as 100 visits of PT and two visits of PT for hip worldwide. We spend a lot of money on PT in the United States, rightly so for certain patients. Knee replacement patients, I think it's critical that their pre-strength, and we're doing that research here at UVM with bi muscle biopsy and their study patients, maybe some of you are participating, pre-strength and post-strength 
really important part of getting from good to great with knee replacement. So yes, people want to bend their knee. And a lot of things you lose with arthritis is bending. When if you come in with a really stiff knee, you're not going to get that all back after knee replacement. If you come in with pretty good range of motion or lost it and got it back with prehabilitation, your rehabilitation after will be much smoother. There's good evidence for that. And your happiness with the entire intervention will be better. Good question. Sure, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, Sorry. If both knees are bad, one might be worse than the other. Yep. What is your, um, I'm sort of your opinion on double knee replacement? Everybody get that one? So should, I have two lousy knees. I've failed comprehensive non-surgical management. They both are significantly impacting my lifestyle. I've got to do something about it. So you are a patient who will benefit from knee replacement. We, we've all agreed to that. Now we have to get you from needing it to doing really well. That in the middle is the problem, okay? Because knee replacement works. But when you do both at the same time, it will stress your heart. It will stress your heart. It will stress your blood supply. Transfusions, increased risk, cost, more importantly, risk of infection with blood transfusions. So, we think very carefully about bilateral simultaneous joint replacement. And we do many every year here. So the answer is yes, in patients who do not have unstable cardiac disease, who are not profoundly anemic to start with, which many women are, by the way, who have chronic disease. We have to do something about that ahead of time, which we can most of the time. So that pre-preparation is the key to the successful bilateral knee replacement. Bilateral meaning both at the same time. So the answer is, in many patients, it's the right answer. But we have learned over the last 15 or 20 years that it's not the right answer for everybody. Some of that work came out of Canada. Some of it came out of Sweden. Some has come right out of Dartmouth. And saying, ooh, we have, to, we, we have to think a little more carefully than we were about bilateral for everybody who needs it because of those risks. So it's a little stratified, and that's how we address it. OK? Thanks. Yep. Is there somebody? Yes, sir. When we stand up and our knees go snap and crackle, is, is that an indication of a problem of osteoarthritis? Uh, it's probably a 75% chance or more if your knee is stiff when you have been sitting for a while and you first get up and it sounds like Rice Krispies and it goes away most of it for three or four or five minutes. Now I'm, I'm better. I'm moving. The gear oil's moving. Thing, the engine's starting to run. I feel better. I go to work, I go to play, and after three or four hours, I start to get stiff and fatigued and a little sore, and it's coming back. That's osteoarthritis. Not every noisy knee is osteoarthritis, that's for sure. But in that setting that I just painted, that's pretty likely. Yep. Yes? Yes. So did everybody hear that? We're talking, this is sort of a general conversation around infection. And are there certain implants that have, I'm going to paraphrase, more risk of infection than the others? The answer is no. When you put something foreign in your body that's metal in a joint, your body immediately recognizes that it's foreign and coats it with a slime to sort of make it more like it, self, yourself. That, that material sort of isolates the, that piece a little bit. Then you get a bacteria inoculation into your body. For women, it's through the, usually through the urinary tract system or the, your dental cavity. For men, it's usually through the prostate kind of area or your dental cavity. And you get bacteria in your bloodstream. And they are floating around your bloodstream. That's called a contamination. You have bacteria where they don't belong. They're not yet set up an abscess. There's no pus yet. You just have inoculation with your bacteria. Well, your white blood corpuscles see that bacteria is bad and gobble them up, unless 
the bacteria finds some place that's got that slime on it, on the, on the uh, implant, heart valve, hip replacement part, something like that. And it goes and sort of changes that slime a little bit. And it actually, the bacteria can actually change their external appearance in that slime. I'm paraphrasing here. And make it harder for your white blood corpuscles and the antibiotic you might ultimately take for this to eradicate the infection. So it's not a function of, okay, this company's or this design or this older one versus this newer one. It's a biologic thing that's going on in your body when you get an implant, period. It happens for everybody. Okay, that's normal. And then the inoculation could start a problem. That is why dental care is so important, amongst other things, for living with your joint replacement. That's why everybody who has a joint replacement in my hands or sees the dentist beforehand, because the last thing you want is a dental problem in the first months after your joint replacement. Infection, bleeding, bacteria, bloodstream, bang. So there's a lot of that pre-surgical -pre safety work that we did not do a lot of prior than five or 10 years ago in the United States that we've brought here that we're doing a lot of now. And the infection rate has gone down and stayed down three years running because we're paying attention to those things. Okay? Does that answer that one? How are we doing? Are we okay? It's like 7.30 or we can keep going or wander out when you're ready. I'm happy to stay a little longer if you want to. Yes. Thanks for coming if you're headed out. But the consequences of Lyme disease are, in my case, two doses of the three-dose Lyme vaccine that then got taken off the market because it was causing the symptoms of Lyme disease in the knees. Is that likely to be osteoarthritis treatable by knee replacement? I do not know the answer to your question. That's a good answer. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more one-on-one -on -one if, you, if you want to, because that I don't think there, we've got all the info there we need, but that's okay. Yes, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Better pain control pre and during and after the surgery. That's a major impact. Um, better fitness of the patients beforehand because we're working on it is an impact that makes it easier to get through. Some of it is the way we do the surgery, the surgical approach and technique, but I think the pain control and the preoperative interventions are way more important than this approach versus that one, quite honestly. Other questions? Woo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Ladies first there. No, no, if their diagnosis is osteoarthritis, just because it was really bad and doesn't necessarily mean they're a higher risk. Infection risk goes up with diabetes, obesity, tobacco. Those are the three we know make a difference. The longer the surgery takes, risk goes up. So if the surgery takes more than 150 minutes, 150, 150 minutes, that's two and a half hours, then the risk of spine surgery, back surgery, bowel surgery, pick one, doesn't matter, that goes up because the bacteria coming off the people in the room, it's not the hospital, the hospitals, it's the people who carry the bacteria. We shed bacteria. I've been shedding bacteria in this room the entire time all of you have. Sorry, right? It just happens. But the lo so if they're really stiff and it's a really complicated case and it takes a lot longer, then yes, that might have an impact on infection rate, okay? That's why, quite honestly, it's a little bit of selling, but in an academic medical center where we have a big team that does big bad cases, tough ones every day, not a bad idea for that really complicated case here as opposed to a little community hospital where I practice for 18 years and I'm a big fan of little hospitals, believe me, that may not be the right situation there because if you're just the guy and his one team member trying to do this really hard case, it might take four hours. Absolutely great job, good outcome, but four hours is a lo too long for a joint replacement because of the infection risk. Okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Thanks very much, you guys, for coming. Thank you.